Hi, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the first ever Funder Showcase at SOCAP. I'm Sandra Osborne Cart, Deputy Director, uh, excuse me, Deputy Chief Investment Officer at Impact Assets Capital Partners. Um, a little bit about uh, the organization I represent and why I'm here. So Impact Assets is an impact investing firm dedicated to changing the trajectory of our planet's future and improving the lives of all people. Um, so one key way that we do that is mobilizing money towards good through investments with the um, just over $3 billion in total AUM. Um, but we're also committed to growing the impact investing ecosystem and showcasing impact fund managers is one way that we do that. So we created the Impact Assets 50, which is now in its 12th year, as a gateway into the world of impact investing for um, investors, financial advisors, and philanthropists. Um, it's really meant to offer an easy way to get started with exploring what firms are already doing really great work in this area and determining what interesting impact investments an investor can make. Uh, the IA50 2024 application is currently open. The deadline is coming up this Friday. So if you are an impact fund manager, um, and you have not applied yet, I highly encourage you to do so. Um, so with that framing, it really gives me a lot of joy to be able to introduce today's Funder Showcase, um, which aims to directly connect funds, many of which have been showcased on the IA50, um, with foundations and to find commonalities in the funding ecosystem. So this showcase is designed for funds, foundations, small family offices, and others that are looking to either directly invest in founders at SOCAP or for funding of their own funds and foundations. Um, today's showcase will bring to the stage funders fund from underrepresented communities and geographies with impact as a core focus of their investment and grant-making work. Um, so we know that there are systematic hurdles that funders from underrepresented communities um, and geographies face, from the limitations of traditional risk management frameworks to the inability to access influential networking circles. Um, so it's really wonderful to be able to shine a spotlight today on these funders um, to bring much needed awareness to some of the true trailblazers when it comes to making impact. Um, so today you'll hear from, um, and please join me in welcoming, the, the group of funders, Linked Foundation, Global Partnerships, New Ventures, Alpha Mundi, Advanced Global Capital, Mercy Corps Ventures, LEAF, Finca Ventures, Linda Vista Foundation, and Novalis and Quotanda, um, and they will not be introduced again, so I hope you all memorized. <laughs> I think they'll probably introduce themselves, but with that, um, I'm thrilled to in invite our first presenter, Danny from New Ventures, to, to come on stage. Thank you. So hi, my name is Daniela. I am the partner of Empodera Impact Capital, a fund ready to transform healthcare in Latin America. So it's going to take 131 years to close the gender gap globally. We lost a whole generation of progress due to COVID. And this is not only about inequality, but about the missed opportunities and great barriers this is going to cost its society. And that's why we launched Empodera Impact Capital, the first fund in Latin America focused on solving the most pressing issues in women's health in the region. So health is a fundamental right. 140 million people in Latin America have no access to health care. The majority women, which proves there, there's a systematic inequity in terms of rights and access. One out of every four women in Latin America has a child before she's 18, fueling the cycle of poverty. And we know that for every $1 we spend in family planning, we have a $120 return in terms of social and economic benefits. We also know that if we have healthy women in the workforce, we could grow GDP in Latin America by 14% in the next five years. So the opportunities are immense. That's why we launched the fund. It's a $30 million fund focused on catalyzing the growth of these scalable health companies. We're gonna focus in series A and Series B investments, tickets from 500K to $2 million. And above all, we're gonna provide technical assistance in gender inclusivity to create better competitive advantages 
and help these companies and entrepreneurs reach their goals. We're very focused on impact. We want to change the lives and measure how we change the lives of over 2.6 million women who have no access or low quality access to healthcare in Latin America by 2030. And we're going to do this not only with impact, but providing market rate returns. We have a great team behind this, New Ventures as a group. We have more than 20 years of experience designing investment strategies, solving some of the most complex social and environmental environmental problems in the region. My partner, Rodrigo, launched the first impact fund, Adobe, in Latin America using innovative finance. We also manage a $20 million fund solving some of the issues in youth generations in Colombia and Ecuador with one of the most prestigious uh, foundations in Switzerland. And we have experience working in gender subjects and, and breaking barriers through Biwala, one of the first credit lens mechanisms in Mexico providing credit to women who have no access to it. So a year ago, uh, not, no one thought this was possible. People thought this was too niche. And today, standing here, I can tell you that we have interviewed over 400 companies in the healthcare space, entrepreneurs with great dreams and visions ready to transform the, the landscape and prove that change, that change is possible and they're completely underfunded. So there's a huge white space in the region that we are ready to attack. So I invite you all not to sit here and wait for the gender gap to become bigger, but to help us unleash the power of women in society in Latin America and build more equitable societies. Thank you. Great. Uh, I'm Jim. Is this working? Yeah, there we go. Um, Jim Villanueva with Gro Global Partnerships. and. Um, I've been told I have 120 seconds to talk about what the Impact First Venture Loan Pool uh, is all about. So I'm just going to go straight to the punchline um, first and tell you that we're providing non-dilutive uh, loan capital to early stage uh, enterprises across Africa and uh, Latin America. Um, I've been doing this early stage investing work for about 15 years now. and consistently um, seeing a gap that we aim to fill and that's uh, entrepreneurs you know they they see a problem they uh, want to solve that problem and launch companies to build a business around that and as soon as they uh, open the doors for business the struggle for uh, survival uh, begins and what happens is that the impact management side uh, of the uh, of the effort tends to get deprioritized and kicked down the road away. So we come in with our highly capable impact management team, do a six to nine month uh, engagement on the impact management uh, front. Um, that includes bringing in our strategic partners at 60 decibels to do a lean data study. Uh, where we speak with hundreds of customers directly, uh, get feedback loops uh, going on uh, you know, the impact, uh, both intended impact that's happening and unintended impacts that's happening, uh, what's working, what's not. Um, and we've piloted this in our social venture fund uh, portfolio with great success uh, and found um, really value-add benefits in several areas. One is obviously uh, the impact management area and being more effective at having uh, the intended impact at scale. Um, secondly, business insights, actionable business insights into uh, customers and what customers want, product market fit, customer-centered uh, design. And then lastly, we found that it's very beneficial uh, in the fundraising efforts when you have hard data and direct customer feedback that, um, that prospective investors and importantly their investment committees can, can really latch onto and, and uh, verify that the impact that they want to have is actually happening. Um, so we're raising uh, recoverable grant capital to execute on this effort, which makes it a, a great fit for donor advice funds and for foundation uh, PRIs, so 
I'd love to talk to anybody who thinks this might be a mission fit, and uh, also equity um, funds and investors who uh, can see the value add that we would bring to the group around the table. Um, and I'll leave you with uh, uh, some feedback that we got from one of our portfolio entrepreneurs uh, where we did this work. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Patricia Chin Sweeney, the acting executive director of the Alpha Mundi Foundation. Uh, many of you know Tim Raji, who is the managing director of Alpha Mundi Group, the investment side. I am stepping in for him, uh, so my apologies. I'm going to give a short presentation uh, and hold to the slides saying on the right page. Uh, many of you know Alpha Mundi Foundation as an impact investor that's been investing over the last 12 years across Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, this uh, today, I'm here to speak about the third fund, which is a LATAM-focused uh, equity investor. You can see from this slide, uh, Alpha Mundi's invested and deployed over $120 million into companies, um, done over 50 equity transactions um, with uh, you know, double-digit returns uh, into just incredible companies. Uh, this new fund is taking lessons learned from investing over the last 12 years to do a few things. Um, let me see which slide actually addresses some of that. Uh, this is the track record of the portfolio uh, to date across Latin America. Uh, just to highlight an interesting example of a company in the current portfolio that will reflect what we're looking at going forward is Xana Solutions in Colombia, which has a proprietary technology that pulls 90% of grease from runoff waste. Um, uh, and turns that into biofuel for the airline industry. Um, that and other critical climate solutions are what we all need to be focusing on. Um, more, again, on the case for why we are focused on this. I am now going to look at the slides in front of me instead. Um, this uh, is all part of the eth ethos of this new fund, which will invest in Series A and Series B companies. Uh, and work closely with, there is a team based in Bogota uh, that has been looking at deal flow for quite some time in this category. Um, I'll just add on two interesting features that we've added to this fund is one, this is in partnership with UNDP, who will be a pipeline partner and also share the companies that we look at, validate their impact, and also push to include other investors into the, um, the investment and growth of these companies. And secondarily, now I can speak to the Alpha Mundi Foundation, which is focused particularly on gender lens and um, climate and supporting companies through their growth. Uh, and so we are raising a technical assistance facility of $1 million or more to be very tac um, tactical to support companies along their path. I think those are, oh, there's more. <laughs> I jumped ahead of the slides. My apologies, I didn't create them. Um, so uh, I think many of you know this. So I will, I'm happy to speak to anyone afterwards and connect you with Tim as well. Uh, these are the sectors that we'll be focusing. And I think I will leave it on this team slide. I believe that's the last, whoops. Yes, thank you. Let's see if it works. There we go. Hi, uh, my name's Suda Baradia. Um, I'm co-CEO at um, Advanced Global Capital, which is uh, an impact investment firm uh, based in London. Uh, we have an impact thesis um, to our fund, which is that we want to get working capital into the hands of SMEs um, all over the world, but with a particular tilt towards emerging markets um, and women-owned um, or women-led uh, businesses. So this slide here um, just kind of gives you uh, a, a sort of a problem. Um, invoice discounting is the product that we mainly support, which fills that short-term working capital gap of 30, 60, 90, 120 days. 
where a supplier has provided a good or a service to their buyer. Uh, there's an invoice that's raised, and let's say it's a 90-day invoice. The buyer is good to pay that invoice, but will wait until day 90 until they pay it. So for that uh, 90, 120 days, um, you know, the SME needs working capital to continue to do the thing that they do. So we, this is the problem that we're trying to address. And the way in which we do that um, is that we um, provide funding to financial institutions all over the world. Uh, they are not banks. They are credit uh, institutions. They could be factoring companies. They could be uh, doing leasing products. They could be doing other working capital loan type products. But essentially, their customers are these suppliers, these small businesses that I talked about. Um, the buyer is paying the invoice um, and it's going through the FI and, and through this um, channel where we are taking LP capital into our fund and then using that um, for, the, for the credit that we provide. We also have um, a gender lens aspect to uh, this slide here actually just highlights some of the, um, the data points that support um, our investment thesis. Uh, we've had our fund live for about eight and a half years, um, but uh, we were funded by a family office in the early days and we piloted some of their money and made uh, proof of concept and then took the fund to market in 2015. So we have an eight and a half year tr uh, track record and we're targeting seven to 9% uh, net uh, return to investors. I'll hand over to my colleague, Sam, um, who will talk about the gender lens thesis of our fund and um, basically the impact lens. Thank you, Suda. I'm Sam, I'm Chief Impact Officer at AGC. I've been there about nine years. So we, when we designed the fund, um, accessibility and inclusivity was central and we have tended to focus on women as uh, both because we care about women's inclusion, but also it's a great way to count things in many countries where you can't count race. So we are extremely proud of our results in this area. Last year, 49% of the financial institution partners that we fund were led by women. So as a benchmark, about 2% of the funding in California from VCs went to women. So we think that's a fairly good result. About 45% of the um, SMEs that our partners fund are led by women. Um, we are ourselves 100% um, female owned, about 67% of our board is women. So very strong governance and support for the things that we try to do. Um, one of the things that we've done as a fund is, is really integrated the needs of a women-led business into how we have designed our fund. Of course, it's layered on what investors need. They want good returns, what our financial partners need. And that was women-owned businesses typically lack access to collateral. So hence the model where you can sell your invoice and, and activate and monetize this piece of paper, even if you're going to be rejected from a bank because of how you look or your gender. Um, quick. Um, transparent and non-usury. So a lot of great, really great features. One of the other things that, I don't know if it was on this slide, our average transaction size is $5,000. So that tells us that we are definitely delivering funding deep down into the long tail of, um, of very small businesses. Um, some of the other you know, great gender metrics, I think the headlines are the 49%, 50%, and yeah, we continue to um, integrate both, our, so our thesis helped us design this fund. It wasn't an afterthought of what comes out of the pipeline and let's try to slap some different ways of measuring. It was definitely on this thesis of what has, has worked for women. We also do a lot of me deep measurement. We measure at the FI level, the SME level, outcomes, outputs, lots of stories that tell us that we're moving in the right direction and we're constantly iterating to make that better. And we'd be happy to talk with anybody who wants to hear more. Oh, and yeah, we have tons of case studies that give you a better flavor on, again, we'll talk to you afterwards and on our website. Thank you. Hello, I'm Scott Onder. I'm the Chief Investment Officer of Mercy Corps and the co-founder of Mercy Corps Ventures. And I'm here with Natalie Vergara, who heads our venture platform. Uh, so we're here today to talk about the crucial role that catalytic capital can play in filling the climate adaptation gap in emerging markets. So uh, the fallout from the climate crisis is already here. Uh, the communities that contributed the least are being hit first. They're being hit hardest. 
130 million more people are going to be pushed into ext extreme poverty this decade as a result. So it's an urgent priority for the global community to invest in climate adaptation, but today we're falling well short. By 2030, it's projected we need to invest upwards of $340 billion per year. Uh, unfortunately, today we're only at about 10% of that level. And to fill this massive capital gap is going to require a generation-defining level of commitment, creativity, and collaboration between the private sector, uh, between governments, and impact investors. And we believe that cap catalytic capital has a really crucial role to play. So visionary entrepreneurs are developing breakthrough technologies, innovative business models, and effective climate adaptation solutions. But there's a funding gap at the seed and scaling stages. So catalytic capital can be used here to seed the earliest and riskiest stages of innovation, uh, to build a pipeline of scalable climate tech companies that can attract private investment and harness the, 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 the capital markets over time. And Mercy Corps Ventures has a seven-year track record of doing exactly this. You can advance it. Um, so we've invested in 47 climate adaptation uh, and resilience startups uh, over the last seven years. We've supported them strategically through partnerships and technical assistance to effectively raise over 400 million in follow-on investment. Uh, we are seeing that 85% of the portfolio companies have successfully raised this follow-on round of investment, and when here in the U.S., less than 50% of startups are able to do this, we know that the support that we're offering is, is effective. We're also a gender smart investor with 49% of our portfolio companies founded or co-founded by women. And when uh, women are disproportionately affected by climate change, we also provide key support uh, to portfolio companies to tailor their products, their services, and their distribution approaches uh, to better serve women. So with our next fund, we're aiming to invest $50 million to catalyze another $500 million in follow-on investment uh, into about 30 companies. And I'll pass it over to Natalie, who can say more. Thank you, Scott. Um, I'm thrilled to be here to speak about the work that we do. And so uh, we're saying we're really a truval, truly global investor. We've invested in companies that have operations in 35 of the most climate vulnerable countries and 27 of the least developed countries. As you can see in the map, our startups have operations in Latin America, West Africa, East Africa, South Africa, and Southeast Asia. And what's amazing to see is companies, for example, as Pula, that was born in Kenya, that now has grown and operates across various countries in Africa, and has grown also to Mexico and Brazil, and provides smallholder farmers insurance so they can crop and produce their products, even like when they don't have rains and so forth. So it's amazing to see this growth in a truly global a global market. And so our Resilient Future Fund, as Gus was saying, it's a 50 million fund, and we're a thesis-driven investor that's investing in climate tech solutions in emerging markets across three thematic areas. The first one is adaptive agriculture and food systems. We're going to invest in companies and continue to invest that are working to increase the resilience of smallholder farmers and food systems. The second one is inclusive fintech, working on companies that provide savings, insurance, and credit to people that have been excluded from the traditional financial service, and investing in climate smart, te climate smart technologies, such as weather forecasts and flood-based predictions, so that people can cope with the effects of extreme climate effects and climate change. And all these startups at the end have a huge impact in underserved people and population, particularly women, migrants, refugees, smallholder farmers, and ruler households. And what makes us different is first, our focus on climate adaptation and resilient solution across these three thematic areas and on a global emerging markets focus, as we were saying. The second, it's our more than capital approach. So we really work with the startups that we're investing in through our TA facility, the venture platform that I lead, where we work with companies on how to embed impact-driven growth and increase their chances of success and scale. We also leverage the network of Mercy Corps that has presence in over 40 countries around the world and more than 4,000 staff members. We will continue to invest in seed stage business, but 
with this new fund, we will be able to provide the follow-on capital that they also need to continue to grow and scale. And finally, we're investing in diverse teams, but more importantly, we're helping those teams to build truly inclusive and diverse businesses from the founder, the leadership, the board, the employee base, and the users that they serve. So please join us to invest and support founders building a more inclusive and resilient future. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, coming this afternoon. Uh, my name is Connor McFarland. I'm the development manager at Local Enterprise Assistant F Assistance Fund, or LEAF. Um, this is a picture of our team here. We've uh, really been able to grow our headcount from about six full-time employees to 16 uh, in the last few years. So it's nice to just have a picture there for you all to see, uh, see our team. But we are an immigrant-led uh, community development financial institution, um, and we work to advance wealth, health, and housing equity uh, all throughout the United States. And so it makes sense for us to start talking about cooperatives. Uh, shared ownership is a principle that we've embraced since our founding in 1982. Um, and cooperatives have a really hard time accessing capital because their governance structure uh, makes it so they're not uh, able to provide a personal guarantee to traditional lenders. Um, and the governance structure itself is just commonly misunderstood by banks uh, and other, other lenders. And so LEAF is just one of a few CDFIs uh, in, in the US that is serving cooperatives all throughout the country. Um, and the, the, most commonly, uh, the most common types of uh, co-ops that we do serve, and we'll cover it more in a little bit, are food co-ops, worker co-ops, and housing co-ops. And so as we move on to racial equity, um, about seven or eight years, or six or seven years ago, uh, LEAF in its backyard in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, we came across this report called The Color of Wealth. And what it found is that in Boston, the net worth of a white household was approximately $250,000, whereas the net worth of a black household was $8, so just $8, no uh, typo there, or no uh, mis, mis um, speaking. And so that really motivated our team to put together a suite of services for minority and women-owned businesses in greater Boston. Um, and we do that through a program called Elevate Small Business, um, where we have free of charge TA for uh, entrepreneurs, uh, procurement services to help entrepreneurs access uh, institutional contracts to grow their revenues, um, and of course, affordable financing at interest rates from five and a half to seven percent. And so, um, as it relates to capital that we provide and the capital that we fundraise, um, and what really makes CDFIs uh, an impactful financial institution for businesses in the U.S. is our ability to provide that capital at such an affordable rate. Uh, so our average cost of funds on the portfolio right now is just about six percent, um, and on the the fundraising side. We, we raise uh, notes anywhere from one to five years with an average cost of funds of about uh, two and a half percent. Um, and so you can, you can kind of see how that, that works and how we're able to uh, keep our cost of funds low to then provide low interest rates to our end users. And uh, a common theme that I've heard uh, at SOCAP, and rightfully so, is that fund managers should reflect uh, the communities that they intend to serve. Uh, and so I think at LEAF, we've really, uh, we really represent that. Um, Gerardo Espinoza, who's actually here in the audience today, is our executive director, and he's an immigrant from Peru. Uh, Jose Luis Rojas uh, is an immigrant from Mexico, and, and Amin Benali is an immigrant from Morocco. And so we have a very diverse leadership team, and Carol Ann McAuliffe just joined us uh, about two months ago. Um, and she is, uh, brings her own unique uh, perspective uh, as an expert in nonprofits and working in the financial sector. Um, and so in addition to our team representing the clients that we intend to serve, um, they also have a wealth of expertise in investment management, banking, um, and other uh, in nonprofits as well. So to elaborate a little bit on our uh, wealth, health, and housing equity programs, our wealth equity programs um, basically include providing loans and TA to worker cooperatives. 
Um, and then the Elevate Small Business Program that I mentioned in Massachusetts, uh, which we already talked about. For health equity, we provide loans to food cooperatives um, and loans and uh, TA to uh, businesses serving food deserts in Massachusetts, so supermarkets um, or anywhere along the food value chain. And as it relates to housing equity, uh, we provide uh, financing to housing co-ops because um, in the kind of a current environment right now, we know that housing is expensive and the purpose of housing co-ops and community land trusts is to preserve long-term -term affordability of the housing. Um, so moving on, just wanted to, uh, I'm not gonna elaborate, I think time is uh, getting a little low, so just to provide a few shared ownership examples, um, you know, food co-ops, are one of those program areas, um, worker co-ops. And really the thing with worker co-ops is that they have their businesses where the uh, workers have democratic control of their business, but also are able to build wealth uh, working kind of a traditional job. And so a worker co-op could be a cafe owned by its workers, or it could be a woodworking plant uh, owned by its workers. So this, the types of businesses that are, uh, can be a co-op are, are very uh, diverse. And I just uh, had a few comments about community land trust and housing co-ops, so just to move right along here. Um, we thought it would make sense to give a, an overview of LEAF's portfolio to just kind of share this composition of where our funding is going. And so you'll see that about a third of the portfolio is in housing, a quarter is in uh, food cooperatives, um, and the remaining, uh, there's 12% in worker co-ops, and about 30% in our two total for our two Massachusetts-based programs. And just for context-wise, about 70% of our portfolio is uh, national, and 30% is in Massachusetts. And so how, uh, how can you help LEAF? Uh, this is um, an exciting time for LEAF. Our balance sheet has doubled from about 15 to 30 million uh, in the last, since 2019. And the number of investors we've had, or we have, has also doubled, or just about doubled, from 100 to 200 investors. And so right now, we are, uh, just seeking to raise about five, five million to $10 million uh, in the next 12 months because the demand for these uh, financing products have continued to grow. Um, and so thank you for taking the time to uh, listen to a little bit about LEAF. Great, hi everyone. I'm Omer Imtiazuddin. I'm the Managing Director of Finca Ventures. We are the impact investing arm of Finca International, which is um, known for microfinance. We have been around for over 40 years uh, on the microfinance stage and even now currently own 17 uh, MFIs. And we were started in 2018 as a way for Finca to expand beyond pure microfinance. So currently, if you look at our portfolio, we've invested off of our own balance sheet. Uh, we have 27 companies overall. 48% uh, of the companies uh, are female founded. Uh, the portfolio companies uh, across the board reach over 13 million people. Uh, and we've got 6.6 .6 million invested since, since 2018. Uh, in terms of uh, the areas that we target, it is a generalist fund. And so we're looking at financial inclusion, uh, agriculture and food security, water and sanitation, uh, reliable healthcare, climate adaptation, and education. And from a um, portfolio overview, we are about 90% Sub-Saharan Africa focused, uh, but for financial inclusion, we made the decision to actually have a little bit of a more global focus, and so we do have two investments in Latin America through that as well. Um, our core sectors, though, are agriculture with uh, 12 companies invested, uh, financial inclusion with six companies, and reliable healthcare with four investments in that portfolio. Uh, we do also have a strong gender lens component to our, to our fund. Uh, we utilize the 2x criteria currently in making investment decisions. Uh, as I mentioned, 48% of our investees have female founders, and 40% of our investees also have a customer base that's over 50% women. Uh, climate is also another area that we obviously uh, are looking at, and our strategy is focused on both adaptation and mitigation solutions. Uh, that help individuals, households, and communities become more resilient. 67% of our portfolio companies uh, have an adaptation impact, 
um, and 100% uh, are assessed on climate risk. Um, and then just maybe a little bit about our key strategies. Uh, so as I mentioned, it is a generalist fund for agriculture. We're focusing on three main areas, uh, which are agribusiness, ag tech, and digital extension services, and then finally financial solutions such as crop insurance. On the water side, uh, we're targeting both solutions that um, increase access to safe and affordable water, and then also waste management solutions. And we have a couple of companies uh, in Jivu and Sanovation invested in this space as well. Uh, on the financial inclusion model, uh, we do both direct-to-consumer products that extend financial services to underserved communities, but then also invest in uh, companies that expand enabling infrastructure. On the health side, again, it is a broad-based strategy, so we've done both brick-and-mortar health facilities uh, with investments in a couple of the largest primary and diagnostic centers in Africa, uh, digital platforms, and then again, financial solutions such as health insurance. Um, on the education front, um, again, we're, it's a broad-based strategy, so we are looking at early childhood development, ed tech development, higher educational and vocational training facilities. In terms of the team, um, as I said, I'm Omar Mkiazuddin. I have over 25 years of experience in both commercial finance and impact investing, uh, starting my career in um, investment banking in a $2 billion venture fund in New York uh, before moving over to the impact investing space. Uh, Eric Wiersma is our uh, senior agriculture advisor. Eric has over 30 years of experience in the ag space. And then our team is rounded out by Melissa Tickle as investment manager uh, and Jacqueline Kagima, who sits in Nairobi. Uh, in terms of the overall fund structure, uh, a couple of things I'll point out. So we are targeting a $50 million fund. Uh, we are also putting in our own first loss capital. So we are going to be putting in up to $6 million as first loss capital uh, in order to be catalytic ourselves. Uh, and then, as, a, as I mentioned, from the... Um, sector-specific side, uh, we are mainly focused on sub-Saharan Africa with, with financial inclusion being, uh, being the exception. Uh, but yes, if anyone is interested and if our impact pieces uh, meet, meet your needs, we would love to have a conversation with you after this event. Thank you. Hello, my name is Allison Fiery, and I am the program director for the Linda Vista Foundation. We are a small family foundation, and our mission is to help empower underserved people in Latin America to help themselves. And part of how we accomplish that mission is that we find people who are already doing really wonderful and meaningful work within those communities, and we financially support their projects. And so I'd like to use our time to introduce you to two of those partners who we really believe in so that they can share the work they're doing. So I'd like to introduce you to Grant Taylor with Quotanda and Greg Krupa with Anopolis. Hi, I'm Grant Taylor, co-founder and CEO of Quotanda, and our mission is democratizing access to education. Um, there's a big problem in that a lot of people can't access education because they can't afford it. They can't afford it. And it's actually the, also the biggest reason people drop out of higher education. Um, schools, universities, foundations, governments, and financial institutions typically want to offer financial aid. They're often limited in their capability to do that. Um, so yeah, people paper time intensive processes. They lack the tools to offer financial aid globally and lack underwriting expertise for student financing. We bring that expertise, we bring the technology, we power student loan origination and servicing globally. Um, we now have, and I'm just gonna rip through these slides here, so we now have 60 clients in over 15 countries. Um, we're serving yeah, a broad range of clients doing very different things. Many are nonprofit, uh, most of the schools uh, university partners that we work with even offer uh, loans at 0% interest and or income share agreements where students pay when they get a job. Um, but yeah, we work with for-profit institutions as well, including some that are here. Um, well, I guess I'm not sure if you, 
you had the chance to meet Lydia from 8B Education Investments that's uh, funding African students uh, studying in the US and the Caribbean. We, that's one of our clients. Uh, Karen actually from Laboratoria. It's a women only boot camp. Uh, Karen is here. Raise your hand, Karen, if you want to say hello to people. Um, so yeah, some, we have some really amazing clients having a tr truly tremendous impact on a global basis. Um, we have you know, proudly supported um, over 5,600 students in achieving their education and career goals with financial aid. We've uh, provided yeah, financial aid over $23.5 million worth of financial aid. And that's loans, income share agreements, um, scholarships as well. The Harvard Foundation has one application for loans and scholarships that we, that we work with, we power. Um, so yeah, most of the students that, that we're financing wouldn't have had the opportunity were we not able to support the, the financial aid they were able to get access with us. Um, this is a big opportunity I wanted to discuss as you may know, there's a huge digital skills gap globally, um, and it's just growing. So um, by 2030, there may be you know 85 million jobs unfilled in the tech space, and just just in that space alone. So our goal was partner with the Inter-American Development Bank that has funded, uh, basically seed funded this opportunity, uh, financing with income share agreements. Uh, students in Mexico from vulnerable populations, so that's uh, women and students from poor, poor communities, uh, predominantly, that with a, one of these tech boot camps that they like Laboratoria as a good example, where you know, students study for th between three and 10 months, they get a extremely marketable skill or skills, so that's everything from programming, data science, design, cy cybersecurity, Salesforce, et cetera. Um, but yeah, really tremendous job placement rates. Typically, it's 85% plus and awesome salaries. We've raised now close to $2, two million for this strategy. But, uh, you know, we should be raising like $130 billion to meet the need that is necessary on a global basis. This is super replicable, super scalable. Uh, we can work with you and other partners globally to scale this anywhere as we are doing with uh, Banco Santander in Spain, for instance, which through Fundación Universia. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Would love to speak with m people more. Cheers. So I want to invite you all to a story. We've all heard some crazy, incredible pitches, but I don't want to make a pitch. I want to tell you a story. And it starts with uh, a patient of ours, Rosa, in Ecuador, who many years ago told me that the first and last time that she had been to the dentist, she was just five years old. Her experience was so negative that she hadn't gone back. Three out of four people in Latin America lack access to quality dental services, and as a result, have deficient oral health. But before I get into what we've been doing about this, I want to talk to you all about my grandmother, Violet. <laughs> who is from Newfoundland and migrated to Chicago in the 1940s with my grandfather, Stanley, a Polak, like me. And because of their love, she came to Chicago and she was a pioneering ER nurse who actually trained all the first responders to go do mobile medicine in the Chicagoland area. And my father and mother are both nurses and my brother David, my older brother David, was born with a congenital deformity that led to limb loss when he was a little boy. But that led to him inspiring so many other people and starting 18 years ago, the Range of Motion Project, which provides prosthetic care to amputees throughout the Americas. We've treated 5,000 amputees in the Americas since the organization was founded all those years ago. And he convinced me to come down to Latin America when I was in college to help him build this um, global health movement, really. Uh, that's me 16 years ago. And that then later inspired me to continue this work. And we founded Novalis almost a decade ago to provide mobile health care in these rural areas of Ecuador. And it's really been a very long journey of mobilizing health, specifically oral health, because oral health is actually the foundation of our overall health and well-being. 
So we provide care on site with portable dentistry, stationary dentistry, working with over 180 corporate partners and community partners to date, over 25,000 patients served, and we're just getting started. You could see one patient in three days while working at their uh, flower farm. Look at the transformation that can take place. Imagine what that means to their overall health and well-being. So that's where we started a social enterprise that's sustainable. And now we want to take it to the next level. How can we treat children who are the most vulnerable amongst us, who don't have access to the services that they need, who are living at risk and vulnerability, but with our partners at SOS Children's Villages, we're launching, imagine 1% for the planet, but for children's healthy smiles. So I'm inviting everyone here today, talk to your dentist friends. <laughs> Everyone's got a dentist friend or a dentist. And we are gonna be launching a pilot <clears throat> to create a new ecosystem of support and solidarity to bring healthy smiles from north to south and from south to north, bi-directional, and how can you contribute? You can certify your, your business, giving 1% through cash, equipment, education, um, and other means. And we actually won an award for this at the end of last year called Reimagining Fundraising, and we're building this ecosystem of support, education, research, partnership, and alliance to be able to really create a whole new system of healthcare access for children living on the edges of society. Um, we have a pilot that we're launching with a $2 million uh, grant fund that we're raising to create this ecosystem to provide care in six locations across Ecuador to uh, 2,500 children. And then from there, with the same partners, SOS, the world's largest children's charity, they're now innovating and starting to put some of their capital towards blended finance. And we're gonna be raising a round in 2025 uh, where they're our lead majority and first loss capital provider, where we'll be expanding nationwide and then hopefully beyond borders into the rest of Latin America. And this is our newest mobile clinic, La Yasuni, uh, which is 100% renewable energy, autonomous, um, really bringing technology into these rural areas. Imagine ha having never gone to the dentist, this is your first dental experience. So just to wrap up, you know, speaking to Rosa, who hadn't gone to the dentist for almost four decades, imagine now what it's like for these children who get to have their first experience being a positive experience, where they then want to share their healthy smiles with their family and loved ones. Thank you, guys.